You don't have to stand now. If you can just keep seated. We're going to go over a few verses here for you tonight. <clears throat> and I'll try to show you a couple of things here. Revelation chapter number 19. And uh, we left off in verse number 14. The Bible says, And the armies which were in heaven... Okay, go ahead, stand up. <laughs> and it's a good testimony for the people. We've had quite a few people watching online and things, and it's a good testimony for them to see that, and so I appreciate it very much. I appreciate you allowing us to have a school. Um, I appreciate uh, your support and missionaries. And I, I appreciate you having a Sunday school. I appreciate being your pastor. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great church. Really, it's a great church. You say, well, you, you all don't have any problems? We got a few. We got a few, but nominal compared to a lot of places. Your eyes are in the right place. Your focus is in the right place, and that's the right thing to do. But uh, it's a blessing to be here and to be your pastor, be a part of this. I'm excited about what the Lord's doing. I can't figure it all out yet, but you all better go to pray, and you're going to run out of places for people to sit down, so <laughs> have to put a chair or two out or something like that. That's a great problem to have. Um, and maybe one day we'll see it happen that way on Sunday night. But right now, I'm glad to have it Sunday morning. A lady said the other day, she said, well, it's getting full on Sunday morning, but it ain't full Sunday night, it ain't full Wednesday. I'm like, well, thank you for busting my bubble. You started on Sunday morning. So maybe it'd take her a while to grow into it. Give her some time. All right, Revelation chapter 19, the Bible says this, verse 13, I have to put this in. He was uh, clothed in a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. The armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. He hath in his vesture and his thigh written, name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, Father, we'd ask now that you might help us as we look into these passages. Pray, Lord, that you'll help us to see what it is that is to come. And thank you, Lord, that because of the salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ, we get to be on the right side of that sword in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, first of all, there's a lot of blood at the second coming of Christ. Uh, come to Ezekiel chapter number 32. Ezekiel chapter 32. Now, a lot of this overlaps. Uh, but it's important that you see these things. Uh, a lot of people don't want to talk about the blood. The Bible says that that blood flows as, uh, uh, as deep as a horse's bridle. I mentioned that to you before. Now, that one, uh, one preacher said, you know, well, what that means is, is the horse is slain in battle. I'll show you in Joel in just a minute that those horses even get stabbed and they don't die. So that can't be true. It's not like the horse gets stabbed and then he falls over and then he gets his bridle in the blood. That's sort of short-sighted. Yeah. That thing is something like 160 miles wide and however long that thing runs, that's a lot of blood. Yeah. That'll run from here past downtown Jacksonville. Yeah. That's a lot of blood. You say, why? It's a lot of dead people. Over 200 million people, over 200 million men come against the armies which are in heaven when it comes time. This stuff they're telling you now, Armageddon, Armageddon's coming. Oh, here comes Armageddon. Israel's going to nuke uh, Iran. Iran's going to throw a nuke back and forth. And China, you ain't even close, man. Amen. That's a 200 million man army just coming from one place. Amen. Now, I, you know, I don't know. I don't get fooled by a lot of this junk going on nowadays. You know, Carrie's over there all night long, gets up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and so I've been up all night, and I'm trying to make a deal with Iran to prevent a nuclear attack, and we're going to do a deal with them, and, you know, I'm so tired, I've been working so hard, and I'm thinking, yeah, I know you're just trying to get the emphasis off of the foolishness going on over here, you're not fooling me at all, man, preventing a nuclear attack, and then say, well, we're going to go ahead and, and, and get concessions, you'll never get them concessions ever again. You just made it worse than it ever was because the next time, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to put them in a position somebody's going to have to punch a button to keep that thing from getting developed. But let me just say this to you. The destruction I'm talking about is not from man flinging nukes. You've got to get that out of your mind when you start hearing the news media using Bible terms of Armageddon. Armageddon comes, the Lord will take full credit for what happens there. It won't be nothing where somebody thought a man did this and a man did that where they, they hit a button, you know, and the thing that came up, the missile silos out of, out, of the, out of the earth and those were actually the demons is really not. It's a missile silo and the man burned this and a man burned that and it's atomic this and atomic that. No, do you know why the Lord has a nuclear attack? He doesn't call it a bomb. He just says, I'll melt the elements, the very thing that make up matter. 
I'll melt the elements with a fervent heat. When the Lord gets ready to come, he'll take full credit. He won't mistake it at all. They don't say, hide us from the wrath of man, hide us from the atomic bomb, or, let's, make a, let's make a prepper thing and go hide in a tunnel underneath, let's hide in a submarine, let's hide in a tube under the water, let's do this, let's do that, and all that kind of... They say, hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Because they know where the judgment's coming from. It's important that you do that. God's a big boy. He can take full credit for the judgment that comes. People are kind of watching out for him and try to make it human instrumentation. You've got enough instrumentation. You can destroy yourself. You've proven that. You ever go back and study World War II? You ever know how many million? Something like 14 million people die in World War II. Man's pretty good at killing himself. <laughs> really, you can destroy yourself. Look at the murder rate in Chicago right now. You can kill yourself. You've got no problem. These kids running around jacking people, knocking them out, you know, and that kind of a thing, and knocking them down and all. They said one old Granny Loomis or somebody, some kid came around here and went to knock her, and she turned around and shot him. <laughs> you ain't knocking me out, sonny boy. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, you know, well, he's taking away all the guns. Yeah, now your murder rate's up with knives. Man's always found a way. Cain didn't have a gun in the garden. You're going to find a way to kill somebody if you want to kill them. What I want you to understand is, is that when the Lord gets ready to come at the second coming, there's a lot of blood, and it's not His blood, and it won't be your blood, but He'll take full credit for it. The birds are going to come down there when He get to that passage in just a little while, and He's going to say, all these birds coming down here. You know, have you ever heard somebody say, that's for the birds? Well, all those dead bodies are for the birds. He says, hey, birds, you want to eat captains and you want to eat kings and you want to eat all these big shots and stuff like that? Have at it, man. They die just like everybody else dies. There's nothing special about them at all. All flesh is grass. I'm going to wipe them all out. All right, Ezekiel chapter 32, uh, verse number 3. The Bible says, therefore, thus saith the Lord, I will therefore spread, thus saith the Lord, excuse me, Lord God, I will therefore spread out my net over thee with a company of many people and they shall bring thee up in my net. Then, I will I leave, uh, then will I leave thee upon the land, and I will cast thee forth upon the open fields, and I will cause all the fowls of heaven to remain upon thee, and I will fill the beasts of the whole earth with thee. He's going to call the lions and the tigers and the hyenas and all the stuff there, and let them just say, go ahead, enjoy yourself, have a good time, eat that flesh right there. The bi yeah, just like that. Won't be zombies eating you. That's another, anyway the fowls of heaven, and I will fill the beasts of the whole earth with thee, and I will lay thy flesh upon the mountains, and will fill the valleys uh, with thy height. Uh, I will also water with thy blood the land wherein thou swimmest, even to the mountains and to the rivers, and shall be full of thee. And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark, and I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light, and bright lights of heaven shall be dark over thee, and set dark. There's an EMP attack. He blows out all the lights in heaven. You know the first one that ever happened in your Bible? It happened back in the book of Exodus. You know what the Lord said? I'll bring a darkness upon thee that is beyond any darkness you've ever seen. And you know the only people that had light? I'm talking about they could light a candle and it wouldn't give light. You say, who did that? The Lord did that. You didn't have to have electricity. He said, you guys are using the sun, I'm blowing it out. You're losing the mo using the moon, I'm blowing it out. You're using the stars of heaven, and all, I'm blowing them out. Uh, you're, uh, you're using fire to get light by and all that, I'm blowing it out. Yeah. No light. People get the mistaken idea that when they're in hell, the Bible's a place of darkness. They say, well, how can it be fire and be darkness? If the light of the world ain't there, the fire that burns ain't going to have no light in it. Amen. So what the Lord did over there in Egypt was is He wiped out the thing they got the power from, the fire. Took it out. No light from it at all. And if you don't have any light, you don't have any heat from it there. But in eternity, you'll have that thing. All right, Isaiah 63. I know you're familiar with these pa <coughs> excuse me, passages. Isaiah 63. 200 million people uh, squashed by the Lord. Smushed, as they say. I think he's got a big horse. I don't think the Lord's going to show up when you get up there. He's going to be a six-foot man. Uh, you look at the Bible, the Bible says, that Do not I, even I, fill heaven and earth? And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 1, He takes off the universe and folds it up like a garment, just like you would fold up a, a jacket or something like that. Well, if that's the case, He must be pretty big. He's got on something like a poncho there, and His head's sticking through the top of it, and that thing comes down in the shape of a pyramid. And so if that's the case, if He fills heaven and earth, He's a pretty big fella. Amen. So when He does have a pretty big horse that He's riding on, it'd be bigger than, you know, the Clydesdale or something here. 
say, well, I don't, I don't know about that. Okay, well, maybe not, but I think it's probably a pretty big one. Isaiah 63, look in verse number <coughs> 1, excuse me. <clears throat> Who is this that cometh from Edom, dyed garments of bows raw? I've read this to you half a dozen times. This is that, uh, uh, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I speak in righteousness mighty to say, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments? Oh, you'd think you're talking about somebody that comes around on December the 25th, wouldn't you? Where do you think they got that red garment from? Coincidence? No, it ain't a coincidence. They're always looking for a counterfeit. It's funny how you spell that guy's name, isn't it? I'm just saying, the same letters that make up Santa also make up Satan. But it's a coincidence. Riding four-footed flying beast. Coming in the night, bringing his reward with him. I don't, I'm trying to be careful. I don't want to ruin it for some of you, but... He looked nauseous. You've got enough time to talk it down between now and then. Oh, well, don't ruin the kitty story and all that kind of stuff. I'm trying to tell you it's a counterfeit. Be in every house in one night? Well, who can do that? Well, the devil can't even do that. It's a counterfeit. The Lord says when he comes down here, he said, I come down and my reward is with me. He don't have a sack of toys on his back. Somebody does. Coming down the chimney. Walking through walls. Sees you when you're sleeping and knows when you're awake. Well, you've got a being up there that, that, that's like Christ, that's able to know everything. It's omnipotent, om, omnipresent, omniscient, knows everything, all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing. Are you kidding me? Why, well, it ain't that fat, white-headed fella. Amen. But you read about Revelation chapter 1, there's a fella sitting up there that's not fat. He don't have a preacher's profile. <laughs> He's up there in heaven, and you know what he says? White hair. Well, wouldn't you know that they would pervert that? Try to venerate it? Red in thine apparel, verse number 2, and thy garments like him. That's blood making them red. I have trodden the winepress alone, and the people there was none with me. I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain the raiment. I can feel the tension right there, folks. I don't mean to ruin your day. But the, the focal point of all this stuff here is the birth and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. And be with your family and give your gifts and stuff like that. But make sure you keep the thing in the proper order. There's only one that can fulfill what they say that guy can fulfill. That's Jesus Christ. He's the one. You, you give him your list of things you want. Not sit on some pervert's lap and give it to him. Oh, well, it don't hurt. I don't know the guy. I know enough about it to know this. I know we used to put a lot of them in jail because the people that apply for those kind of things have a tendency to like the little kitties. You going to let your kid sit on somebody's lap you don't know? Oh, what's the harm in it? What's the big deal? You're a pedophile. That's the big deal. Get out of my face. My kid going to be here? You come talk to daddy. And together we'll talk to the Lord. Hey, will you do something for me? You're praying to him? Uh-uh. Yeah, you're getting mad now, I feel it. So. <laughs> the Bible says, For the day of vengeance, verse number four, uh, four, is in mine heart. The year of my redeemed has come. And I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury had upheld. You know those people, ladies and gentlemen, even the heathen get involved in that stuff. There's something wrong with that. Amen. That's not the same God we worship. Amen. They try to make it like he's, like he's a God. Ho, ho, ho. Where do they get that? The Lord, when he says ho, he means, you better hang on, boy. I'm fixing to stomp a mud hole in your hind end. That's peacock. Interpretation. <laughs> oh, he ain't talking about somebody at 8th and Main either. He means, whoa boy. It ain't funny when he says, ho, ho. It ain't laughing. You know, with a little twinkle in his eye. Uh-uh. 
I'm sorry I ruined it. I'll make it better for you, though. Now you get to quit. Now you get to quit lying. <laughs> Who's the father of lies? But that can't. I mean, but that's an all. That's all right, though. I mean, you know. I mean, it's just a, a little lie. What kind of lie is it? Oh, it's a, what, what is a white lie? Is that worse than a, or better than a black lie? It's just a little lie. It's a lie. Who's the, who, who's the giver of all truth? Jesus Christ, right? Matter of fact, true and righteous in the one of his name. Faithful and true, right? Thy word is Okay, well, that's the complete opposite. Why would you fool with something like that? Amen. Well, because it's good for the kid. Hey, kid, teach the kid about the man that really matters. When that guy comes, it's kind of like, yeah, man, I'm riding in his sleigh. <laughs> Behind him. I, I don't want to, uh-uh. I ain't going to be here on the receiving end of that. Bringing you presents. Daddy Sweat brings you presents. I didn't mean to get on that stuff. And mama too. That's exactly right. Where'd this come from? Some unknown entity that popped down here in the middle of the night. I'll tell you where it came from. That represents 15 hours of work. Something you're going to learn about if you're going to live in this house. Come on, man. Look, man, I'm just telling you, you want the truth, but, well, preacher, but, 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 but not about that. There's just some things you shouldn't address. Says who? Well, if I was up there, I wouldn't say that. When you get up here, don't say it. But right now, I'm up here. I'm saying it. You say, well, I, well, I don't want my kid. Oh, well, you never know what might come out of up here. It just so happens I can't deny that the correlation's there. Four-footed flying beast. Where do you think they got that? You think the guy was Muhammad that came up with that? Everything Muhammad came up with, he came up with from a Bible and an ungodly spirit. Yeah, read the religion. You'd be surprised how much of that stuff mixes and mingles over with Joseph Smith. If you know anything about it. Joseph Smith, who's that? The founder of the Mormons. Not the Tabernacle Choir either. <laughs> golden plates. Never saw them. Invisible golden plates that a macaron, I mean, that, a, that Maroni gave him, an angel with. Yeah. Well, what happened? Oh, an angel came down to Allah, I mean, to uh, Muhammad and delivered to him the message. You know what Joseph Smith said? I'm the second Muhammad. What's he mingling that up with? You know what he said? He said, well, if uh, they're not going to let me practice peaceably, then I'll take it by force. That's Islam. That's two religions, but they have the same root. You know what the root is? You'd be surprised how much those things are alike. They have multiple wives, don't they? Well, doesn't Islam allow you multiple wives? Yes, sir. You don't think. It's just a little lie. Yeah, just a little lie. The most dangerous lie is that one that's 90% true. Those two things are connected. Joseph Smith found all that stuff. You read Joseph Smith, you know what? You can't, you can't, you can't miss it if you read any at all. That guy got all of his theology from reading a whole bunch of other people. And then put it in his own words. He plagiarized that whole thing. Anyway, that's Bible school education there, but it'll help you a little bit. That's dangerous stuff you fool around with. You worship the devil when you worship those lies. Be straight up. Verse 6, I will tread down the people in mine anger and make them drunk in my fury. I mean, get carried away on all that stuff. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. All right, come to, uh, let's see, did I give you Isaiah 34? I didn't give you that yet. Come to Isaiah 34. Talking about the land soaked with blood. And then we'll move on to verse 14. And I'm going to show you the army that's going to do it. Isaiah chapter number 34. Look in verse number 1. 
Come near ye nations. There's your united nations. All that thing's put together by the Lord. He's put a hook in their jaws. Eventually, he's going to draw them together. You've got a guy over here who thinks he's the king of the world right now, and he's trying to you know, tell everybody how to live and all that kind of thing. got no respect for him at all in any way. What's, but he's a legend in his own mind. But just so that you know, that whole thing is spiritual. God's winding this thing up. You say, what happened with Saul? Saul became a legend in his own mind, and Saul started doing things the way he wanted to, but he didn't do anything that God wasn't aware of, and God let him do that because the people said, we want a king of our own. And Sam said, no, you don't really want that. And they said, yes, we do. Don't tell us what we want. And the Lord said, give them to him. Get him Saul. And Saul came in there, and by the time Saul was done, that nation was in ruins. He taxed them out of everything. Your taxes ain't going to go down. I don't care how much and who you put in office. You say, why? You're sunk. You're sunk. And it has nothing to do with the guy sitting in the outhouse up there. Nothing. Sitting up on the great white throne there has nothing to do with him. It has to do with God saying, you don't want me in your school. You don't want my Ten Commandments. You don't want me on your dollar bill. You don't want me where you can sing Christmas carols out here and mention the name of Jesus. You don't want the name of Jesus in your prayers. And you don't have anybody that will stand up with any backbone and say it. Okay, fine. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm out of here. Y'all can have it. You're in the book of Judges as sure as I'm standing here. Judges lines up perfectly with Laodicea, that seventh church age. Every man does that which is right in his own eyes. That's how Christians are nowadays. You ain't telling me what to do. I'll come go as I please. I don't need the church. I don't need... Well, the Bible says you do. You call yourself a Bible believer, forsaking not the assemblies together, even more so you see the, such you see the day approach. He said you're supposed to gather together. You know what's happening? Our house churches are cropping up and people are becoming their own masters and they're becoming their own preachers and they're becoming their own fathers and they're becoming this and that and the other. And They're setting up their own religions and all that because they're fulfilling the book of Judges. Every man did that which is right. That's why he said in the last days, don't get away from each other. Wrathed up, get together. The devil says, get apart, get apart, get apart. You get apart, you go crazy. You get too far apart, the next thing you know, you go nuts. You start believing your own stuff. You get demented in your mind. You get twisted the way you think. And then you get to thinking you get persecution complex and everybody's against you and nobody knows God like you know God. You're spiritual. I don't need that a man teach me. You take it completely out of the context. Did the Lord tell you don't forsake these? That's in the book of Hebrews. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. You going to take Hebrews and dispensationalize it for me? How come Jesus Christ, when he said that he came and gave his life for the church and he loved the church, and then he tells you, now you go start your own little deal. If you want to come, fine. You don't want to come, it's free will. I can't force you to come. I'm just simply saying, you claim to be obedient to God. How come all of a sudden you despise what he died for? He put it here for a reason. You know why he put that in there? Because he knew in the last days, everybody's going to split off and become their own master. I'll be my own boss. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Okay, fine. All I can tell you is, is let's just see how it plays out the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah, we'll see how it plays out. Okay, all right. Really, I'm, I'm at a point where I'm not arguing anymore with people that say reading the Bible's good for you and studying the Scripture's good for you and praying's good for you and coming to church is good for you. I believe it, but I ain't going to argue with it. If you don't want to believe it, then fine, don't apply it. I believe it the same way the Lord does. The Lord says, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man come to the Father but by me. You don't want to believe that? Okay, I guess you'll have to go to hell then. He don't argue with you. He said, look, it's me or that. You take the choice. You know what he says? You don't want to come? Okay. I'll give you the desires of your heart. I'm about that way with Christians nowadays. I'm I'm like, look, you want it? Fine, here it is. You want to do it his way? If you don't, fine. Go ahead, you're going to self-destruct. You're going to come apart, but... There's always the exception. You know, people think, well, I can, I'm going to make an exception to the rule. No, you ain't. You're not the exception. You're not wiser and smarter than God in the Bible. He tells you that's what you're supposed to do. You just don't want to submit. You've gotten where nobody can feed you anymore. Nobody can preach to you anymore. And you can't be under anybody's authority anymore. You become your own authority. You're the I will guy in Isaiah 14. I'll have it my way. God says, well, my, my, my. Bible believer, are you? Servant of servants, are you? Humble, want to be great in the kingdom? How come you can't submit to my word? I didn't say submit to the pastor or the church or the church edict. I said, how come you can't do what God tells you to do? You claim to believe the Bible, right? Right. Right. What do you just pick and choose and cut out what you want? Why don't you just go ahead and put the cat of nine tails in your hand and cut that part of his flesh out? 
just whoosh, just rip it out and say, I don't know, I'll do what I want to do. Okay, well, go ahead. <laughs> but I don't think it's in your best interest. Isaiah 34, come near ye nations to hear and hearken to the people, yet the earth here and all the, there, there, excuse me, that is therein, the world and all things that come forth. The indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. We've been through that. And His fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. He's bringing them there for the purpose of killing them. Revelation 14, He is bringing them there, not turn there, He's bringing them there for the purpose of killing them. He's not bringing them there to sit down and discuss and to have a peace pack and to whether or not they want to believe what... No, He's done. When He shows up the battle of Armageddon with us, with His armies, which I'll show you in a minute if I can get around to it, when He shows up, He is bringing them there for one purpose and that's to destroy them physically. 200 million of them. He's going to squash them and smush them and ride over them until He stomps all the blood out of them. He's bringing them there to kill them. You're loving God. You say, you don't want me? Fine, I'll kill you. You say, well, man, I I just don't get... No, 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 wait a minute. He gave him a chance, didn't he? What's the problem? You must have a guilty conscience. What's the problem? You don't want to get killed? Okay, get on the right side. Well, he's not going to force me. You're not going to win me by scaring me. Okay, fine. There's a train coming. Yeah, whatever. You better get out, man. There's a train coming. It's going to kill you, man. You're not going to win me with fear. Trying to scare me. Listen, man. There's a train coming. And when it hits you, if you don't get out of that car, it's going to run over you like and smush you. <coughs> Could you lower your voice, please, and stop screaming at me? What's going to happen to that fool? He's going to get run over by a train. Some Christians that way nowadays. Oh, you're too intense, that lady said. You're too serious. It's just you, you take this stuff too serious. You, I mean, it's like, man, relax. You relax, lady. I'm perfectly fine. I feel perfectly relaxed. But when I preach for the Lord, I'm going to preach the way I believe. I think the Lord's sending it and saying, hey, you face to get run over by a train, stupid. I don't think the Lord is saying, hi, how are you today? Lovely day, isn't it? Beautiful sky. By the way, you know, I think it would be in your best interest to please exit your vehicle. Because in just a few moments, the train is going to come this way. And you know, when metal and metal come together and flesh is there, it just doesn't make too pretty a picture. Would you like to consider and think for a while as to whether or not you would like to please exit the vehicle? And the Lord said, get out! Get out! Get out! Three strikes, you're out! Why are you yelling at me? He's in hell screaming, and, and what's he going to say? The Lord didn't tell him? What about the heathen in Africa? What about them? What about them? Why does the Lord send the heathen in Africa to hell? What makes you think they went there? What makes you think God didn't deal with them? What, are you all of a sudden playing God? You've got a guilty conscience, don't you? You're trying to hide something, aren't you? What about the heathen at Walmart? That's God's business. That ain't your business. Who the fire do you think you are? God, you're being unjust. You're sending all those ignorant, dumb, stupid people over there in the jungles of Africa that don't know anything about you. They may know more about Him than you think they do. If the Bible's right in Romans chapter number 1, well, you know, I'm just what... No, you're ducking it. I tell them all the time now, I've, I've gotten bad about it now. They say, what about the heathen in Africa? And I say, what about them? That ain't my problem. I'm not called to Africa. I'm in the United States of America. What about you? You want to ask God? Go ahead. When you come up out of hell later on, you stand at the great white throne and say, what about the heathen in Africa? The Lord said, I don't know, they're frying with you or they're up here. You're so worried about them. You didn't get saved and went to hell and burned. Now you go in the lake of fire and you're going to lose your soul and burn forever. Amen. What about the heathen in Africa? That intellectual uh, 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 garbage. That's such foolishness, man. I've never seen it in my... Trying to outthink God. Amen. You ain't God. God don't answer to you. Amen. Some of you Bible believers, you're, amazed. you're, just, you're just stubborn. You're arrogant. You're obnoxious. You're just like, well, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. God needs to explain to me why He's God. He don't answer to you. That would make you God. 
Hey, God, manifest yourself right here and explain what you're doing right here. And God says, <laughs> Hey, you kidding me, man? You're not God. You don't command me. I'm God. I don't answer to you. What do you hear? <laughs> you know what that cricket's saying? Stupid, stupid. Stupid, stupid. Stupid, stupid. <laughs> That's what he's saying the whole time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there's a, there's a, there is a, a fear for a God that doesn't have to give an answer to his creation. He made you. And then he gave you a book and he said, go buy it or don't. It's your business. Do whatever you want to. Now, are you going by it? I guess most of you are. You're here tonight. But this idea that you're the same level with God, you're demented. Yeah. Something wrong with you. You're twisted in the head. They need to get you a padded cell on a straitjacket and shoot you full of Thorazine or something and have you walk around. What happened to you? I was thinking I was equal with God. He sure showed me. It won't be long before all of a sudden the Lord will just flick you like a fly and the next thing you know, you'll be twisted up and messed up and stuff like that. And the Lord said, that's who I am. What do you think, Jake? Amen. Amen. You think you can argue with me and you think you can tell me what yeah. to do? Mm. Mm. How about that, Jake? You'll just walk with a limp the rest of your life to remember when you start questioning me, I'm going to always come out on top. Right. You want to play chess with the Lord? Help yourself. I ain't that stupid. I'm pretty stupid about some things. <laughs> but there's some things I just don't mess with. And God's one of them. That's right. You've got to get out of this theological mindset that a lot of these modern day preachers are up there saying, you know, we'll argue with God about it. Hey, go ahead and be stupid. You walk by faith. Right. You don't walk by sight. God said the greatest thing I can do for you is just trust it. I wrote it to you in, your wor in the Word. That's right. Amen. So go buy it or don't. He said, well, I gave you the Word. What would you do with it? Nothing. I just, I just don't like to read, you know, and I just don't like to... You know, I mean, I don't really understand the point of it. And, you know, it's just, okay, fine. Go ahead and be stupid all your life. Yeah, I meant exactly what I said. You say, why? I'm preaching right now. I'm here to tell you the truth. That's God's Word. You know what He's going to ask you? Did you read it? How are you going to do when you stand up there against somebody like uh, 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 Brother Levon? Brother Levon, who's now up in his 70s, and hasn't been given the ability to read because he went to work before he finished elementary school. How are you going to handle that? And he sits there and says, well, at least I went through it a couple times with tapes, and at least I've been through it a couple times on my own, and I might have to ask people what the words mean, and some of you people, you ain't been through it one time ever on your own. What's the matter? What are you ducking your head for? God's going to say, did you read it? Did you study it? No, preacher, you know, that's for, that's for preachers to do. You read it for us and tell us what it says. <laughs> I can't take the test for you. Every man will be tried to the judgment seat of Christ. I can't take it for anybody in my family. I can't take it for my friends, and I can't take it for my congregation. And I love you. You know what God's going to say? Every man will give an account of himself, of himself, personal accountability. My job is to tell you. Well, don't be getting on to me for not reading the Bible. You're in church. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know what's a strange thing to me? I'll get to this in a second here. But you know what's a strange thing to me? Your kids go to school and they tell you you've got to read so many chapters in social studies or history or, or, uh, or algebra or math or whatever it might be. And you come home and you'll near about blister their tail or put them in time out or whatever you do if they don't do their homework. the last time you did some homework for the Lord. You're supposed to read so many chapters for your English lit class. And you go to class and you sit down there and they say, okay, we're going to have a pop quiz. And you were like, well, I didn't read it. Well, I didn't read it. No fair. No fair. No fair. You get up there in front of the Lord and the Lord will say, did you read it? How'd you learn to read? Why do you think I let you read? Why do you think I gave it to you in English? Because I intended for you to read it. You can tell when somebody's reading it. You can tell when somebody's not. It's a, it's a choice you make. Well, it's just, you know, it's the Bible, you know, and everybody has it, and we just have it around, and we just, you know, uh-uh. That ain't what he said at all. He said, give attendance to reading. You want God to help you? You know what you better do? 
You better get the strut out of his step and get some calluses on your knees and get out on your face before God and get your nose between the pages of that book. And I don't care if you think you can... What do you think you're going to understand? It's a guy smarter than you wrote it. He ain't going to understand it. You get down there and read it and say, God, I don't get this. Good, keep reading. And you keep reading until you run across something you do. <laughs> yeah, there's plenty in there you do. When they came to Coolidge and said that, you know what he said? It's not the things I don't understand in the Bible that bother me. It's the things I do. <laughs> well, President, can you tell us what it says about hell? As a matter of fact, I can. It says you don't have to go there. <laughs> That's pretty smart stuff. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I, don't, I, I really I don't mean to be rough on you, but I'm a cotton-picking choir boy compared to when you face your Savior. Amen. Right. And 90% of you are illiterate and can read. And you know more about an iPad and an iPod than you do about what the book says. Amen. Don't tell me it takes somebody uh, with great intellect to get it. Do you see these little ones up here? How old is your class, Miss Sharon? What age is that? I don't know what kindergarten age means. That could be 16 years old nowadays for all I know. 16. Yeah, I'm still in kindergarten. Okay. Four and five years old. You hear him quoting those verses from memory? How many can you quote? When's the last time you just memorized some scripture just for the sake of memorizing some scripture? Just to purify your heart. Really, I mean, just to kind of activate it a little bit. My, my, my. Sure, I've gotten sophisticated, haven't we? I thought you were talking about the second coming of Christ. Yeah, but it'd be a bum deal for you, man. You come back up there thinking, man, I sure wish I'd have done more. I didn't even read the Bible while I was down there. That's old, that's old time stuff. That, that, that lazy, you know, that's for the preacher stuff. He's the, he, he, he's the one we hire to preach to us. You think that relieves you from your responsibility? Okay, we'll see you at the judgment seat of Christ. I'm a good person. Okay, great. Fine and dandy. Your measuring stick ain't me. It's him. Amen. You're going to get up there and the Lord's going to ask you flat out. You think you're going to sham him like you do other people around you? Nope. You think you're going to connive and cut the rug with him and he's going to say, well, you know, I understand. Life was tough. You think he's going to do that? Life was tough. As he sticks that hand out there and says, what was that you said? <laughs> by, by the time I was 33 years of age there, Sonny, I was hanging on a cross for you. What do you mean life was tough? I faced the devil one-on-one -on -one in the wilderness. Life was tough, was it? I was despised and rejected and hated. My own father turned his back on me. Was that? Life was tough. You were too busy. You've got a realistic view of things. He's holy, he's perfect, he's pure. These excuses you give to modern man nowadays, they take it because they're like you are. We're all guilty of something. Amen. Amen. That's why it's so hard for a preacher to preach. Well, who's he think he is? He's just a man like we are. Hey, what's your problem? You take orders from man all around the world here. You take orders from the law on the streets out there. You take orders at the restaurant. You sit where they tell you to sit or you get out of the restaurant. When it comes to God and the Bible, you're strange about that. He's just a man. We don't follow no man. Ain't no man going to tell me, Oh, shut up, man. What's your problem? You're just rebellious when it comes to spiritual things. Okay, then go find somebody that can tell you. I can tell you who it'll be. The guy you look at in the regular mirror every day. That'll be the only one you can take orders from. And people tell me all the time, I, I'm not having nobody tell me what to do. The Bible says I don't need not that a man teach me and all that. Well, the Holy Spirit ain't taught you nothing. He sure ain't taught you nothing about subjection, about submission, about being low, about being a servant, Amen. about being a foot washer. He ain't taught you nothing. Amen. You got your head so far up in the air the first time that the enemy's running low on ammunition, you'll be the first one he shoots because you think you're somebody. You never walk around in time of battle with your head up high and wearing your insignias around because with the enemy is running low on ammunition, they take out the leaders first. Amen. The warrior always walks best with his head bowed. No matter how bad he is, he's not interested in letting everybody know about it. Tis the season to be jolly. <laughs> Fa la 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 la. Mike and back, folks. 
I'm so tired of the shaman and the lion and everybody acting like something that ain't. It just, it's, it's the most irritating Joel chapter or Song, uh, Song of Solomon chapter 6. Song of Solomon chapter 6. Is this too much for you? It's, uh, it's only 6. Give me just a couple minutes here. I wanted to try to at least show you who this army is. This army is a literal army. Did you know that? Uh, look in John chapter 18 and then we'll come back to Song of Solomon. This army is an army that eventually, right now it's a spiritual army. Right now you're not supposed to be riding the path to the second advent like a lot of people think they are. I'm, I'm getting on to Christians tonight, not unsaved people. Amen. I'm speaking my mind to Christians. You say, why? You're born in the day and age where you've got everything you could possibly even think about having and your love for the Lord Jesus Christ has waxed cold. Amen. You've gotten accustomed to your routine and your rut. You wonder why your family's falling apart? Because you are, old man. Because you are, old woman. Because you are, mom. Because you are, dad. Because you are, husband. Because you are, wife. Because you are. The living. They're simply a manifestation of what you've been letting slip for generations. You can't do it and get away with it. There's a price. Whether you like hearing it or not, your families are falling apart because your relationship with the Lord fell apart a long time ago, if you ever had one. Amen. This, I'm a nice person, garbage. That don't cut it. Nice person don't make you spiritual. Amen. And God's not a respecter of persons. Well, I'd be glad when God knocks a tar out of you, you smart aleck. Okay, fine. I got mine coming too. But it doesn't negate the fact that I'm telling the truth and the way you just respond to that lets me know you're guilty. You're letting it slip. And the manifestation is, you look at your, you ain't even got to look at the nation. Look at your family. You say, what is that? Somebody dropped the bucket. Because you played it down your whole life. made That's ah, no big deal. Yeah, it's no big deal. Just eternity, just heaven and hell on it. You know why you did that? Because you're guilty about not wanting to get kids involved and all that because it put too much pressure on you to have to go to church and read your Bible and pray and you hadn't wanted to have too much fun all your life or you wanted to work yourself to death. Amen. Now all of a sudden, you know, I guess I need to ramp it up and amp it up, you know. I don't know why this generation's like it is. Because of you. That's just the truth. You want the truth? That's the truth. Well, I don't, I don't, that's just your spin on the truth. Not if the Bible's right. Amen. The generations behind you get worse and worse and worse. Why? Because the ones that are supposed to be mature and take the responsibility for the raising of the family ain't doing it. Right. Sham and lie and sneak and connive and do hook. And guess what? They all turn out the same way. Imagine that. It's like putting a tomato seed in the ground and going, it'll surely come up oranges. I know it will. I've been praying for oranges. I'm a good person. They're coming up. How them tomatoes come up? Because you put them in the ground. Amen. I realize when kids get to a certain age, they make their own decision, but that doesn't relieve us from the responsibility of have we done our part. I say no. I say we haven't. I say we're all guilty. Yes, Some more than others, but we're all guilty. Yes, this army which is in heaven that he's talking about here is the body of Christ, and it's a literal thing. Right now it's spiritual, but eventually it's going to be the real thing. Look in John chapter 18. <clears throat> I get wore out with this, blaming the devil. I'm sorry, I can't get off of it for some reason. Blaming the devil for everything. It ain't the devil. You don't have any contact with God anymore because you deserted him a long time ago. You pray and God don't hear you. You say, why? You left him. You ditched him on the side of the road when he don't help you out anymore like you think he should. You get to running with the wrong crowd and all that other kind of stuff. And oh God, no oh God, no oh God. And why is this mess happening to me? And the Lord's like, <laughs> you kidding me? You dropped me off a long time ago and decided to go your own way. Until you come back to where you dumped me. See you later. If I regard iniquity in my heart, David said, the Lord will not hear me. 
You pray, what's the matter? The Lord says, well, you're asking me stuff to do for you. I asked you to do stuff for me, and you wouldn't do it. So why should I do stuff for you now? Amen. You won't do what I ask you to do. Why should I do what you're asking me to do? Well, why should he? You had a friend of yours, you asked him to help you out and ask him to help you out and ask him to help you out and he never helped you out and then you call him up one day and, and or, yeah, you've asked him to help you, he calls you up one day and says, hey man, can you come help me out? You going to be the first one over there? <laughs> you say, well, surely not, preacher. That's a dumb thing. Yeah, isn't it? Amen. Jesus is your friend, is he? You do what he tells you to do? <coughs> so you don't know what you're talking about. You're half out of your mind. If you love him, you keep my commandments. Sometimes he says to you, here's what I want you to do. You say, oh, Lord, that's not going to be popular for me. You think you can run with the old crowd and still run with Jesus? He don't run like that. He don't play like that. He ain't going to get filthy for anybody. You make a choice to follow him, and when you do, it cuts the crowd, buddy. You ain't got to cut them. You run with Jesus, they'll run from you. I'll, I'll give you this thing about the body of Christ here, and then we'll go home. I'm scared, man, of what we're going to face when we get up there. I just, it, it just, this shaman and this line, I, I failed to, to show you the, the real holiness of God and the fear that you ought to have of Him. Yeah. He wouldn't do it. But you serve a God, ladies and gentlemen, that if you stood up there after He bought and paid for you and He wanted to put you in hell, there's nothing you could do about it. God, you lied about it. Okay, see you later. Get out. He wouldn't do it. Well, I'm going to go toe-to-toe. And then when you're done, what's he going to, he's going to have his way, ain't he? And, you, and, you, and you, you, you get this idea. It's like you're down here and you're arguing with your husband or your wife or something. <sighs> what happened to you? Where did you get the idea he's a man? You've, you've humanized him too much. Man, I'm talking holy. That don't, that, I mean, holy. Holy, so holy that he can destroy everybody on the earth except Noah and his family and never think nothing of it. That's right. He can squash over 200 million people at the Battle of Armageddon and never clear his throat and be righteous and just in doing it. That's right. and, and you're going to plead with him your, your case, your call. What? Where do you get that? I don't get that. But that's how we are nowadays. That's just God. And what's that mean? I mean, it's just God's Word, big deal. Prop up the window with it, man. Really? Let it sit there until next week. The preacher gets all wigged out about the words of God, and big deal, man. Okay. You lost your fear, Christian. You know what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 about the judgment seat of Christ? One of the few places the word terror is used. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Are you afraid? Well, why not? It ought to be because you love him. But you live the way you do because you're not afraid. You're not scared at all. You're what my daddy used to call smart aleck. It's actually smart aleck, but he'd say smart aleck. Southern kind of a draw there. You're a smart aleck. That's why you live the way you do. I'm going to do it. And God told me not to do it. And I don't care. I've got this my own life. I'll do what I want. He ain't telling me what to do. It's just the third part of the Trinity, just the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Who's he to tell me? You're a boss, stupid. Yeah. You're bought with a pride, aren't you? Yes. Galatians 5, you have a choice. You're going to walk in the flesh or walk in the spirit. Right. Amen. I wonder why Christians get messed up. Why do good, the bad things happen to good people? Because they're stupid, that's why. Amen. That's one of the answers nobody wants to tell you. Right. Some of it happens for God's glory. Some of it happens because God blisters your hind end because you think you're equal with him. And all God does is reach, and somebody preached about a toolbox or something the other day, and they're talking about, you know, God's got a toolbox. Yeah, he does. And in it, he's got a big old paddle about that long. And if he wants to, he can blister your hind end and think nothing of it. I told you, don't? Okay, fine. Beats the fire out of sin, don't it? Some of you are so arrogant, you don't need God anymore. He forgot your roots. He forgot where you came from. You forgot what God did for you when he saved you. But now you're flying on your own. You're solo, man. You don't need nobody teaching you nothing no more. Big shot. Smarter than most. I got it. I don't need no Bible. You know what God will do? He'll drop you on your little pumpkin head. 
Yes, he will. You wind up slobbering out of one side and your eyes are going every which way and you're walking around twisted up and messed up and the Lord says, what was that you said? He put Jonah in the belly of a whale and didn't think nothing of it. Let him slosh around in there and let him keep his life there and then he winds up going, going down there to hell and Jonah's down there pleading and stuff like that. You say that didn't really, yes, it did really happen. You know why? Just because he disobeyed one order. Nowadays, what happens is, is God keeps letting you get away with it and get away with it and get away with it, and you think, oh, well, you know, he ain't going to do nothing to me. Okay. He might just wait until you get to the house. He might wait until you get to the judgment seat of Christ and say to you, uh, remember how you said I wasn't going to do nothing about it? <laughs> well, your sins are under the blood, but we'll be given every man a reward for the work done in the body, whether it be good or bad. So guess what? You lose that reward. I'll give you this other stuff on Wednesday night. Wednesday night, I'd like to have a Thanksgiving service <laughs> and, uh, and um, say a few things about things to be thankful for and let you all say some things to be thankful for, and then I'd like to have the Lord's Supper because I don't believe anything we have we would have gotten if it hadn't been for the Lord. Amen. Bob Jones Sr. said a long time ago as a great, as a great statement, he put it in one of his chapel talks. But he said this. He said, the first step to apostasy is ingratitude. Yes, I find when a Christian becomes ungrateful that he's forgotten where he came from and he thinks he deserves more than it and he's bitter and he's angry and he's mad and he drops out on the fundamentals of the things that God says is important to him and he becomes his own guide, he becomes his own director, he becomes a type of the Holy Spirit, he leads his own life. He's no longer in subjection but the devil's deceived him into believing him he is. And now everything he hears, it's twisted and it's turned and people are all, everybody's an apostate now. You ever known anybody like that? Hyper-spiritual individual. Yeah. Satan's the most spiritual creature in the Bible. That's right. If there was anybody hyper-spiritual, it's the devil. Right. We can all be deceived. The Bible says if you think you're something when you are nothing, you deceive yourself. All right, I hope.